Everyone is talking about why gamers are so sus about blockchain gaming studios, NFTs, and the monetization of games. In all this discussion, one critical topic is missing. There's been almost no dialogue about what it is gamers actually want from their gaming studios and their gaming titles that are being released today. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past few years, you know how opposed to crypto gamers are. Gamers, in fact, I've heard talk about crypto users as if they're a bunch of environmental terrorist Ponzi schemers. And the crypto crowd tends to think of gamers as all a bunch of normie boomers who are just throwing away money after terrible video game studio executives. We're going to try and cut through all that clutter today as we discuss three core elements that gamers actually want from their gaming studios. As an avid gamer who's been critical of blockchain in the past, let's dive right into it. This is going to be the introduction to our series on the state of gaming, and it's going to be a fun one. What is going on, Metaverse? I'm Animositas, and this is Annie Knows. We welcome gamers, spectators, investors, and degenerates alike. Like you, I have an interest in gaming and crypto. Unlike you, I'm the only person who gets to take my ideas as financial advice. My purpose today is to entertain, inform, and inspire you, not necessarily in that order. So this is what Annie knows about what gamers want. The first thing of the three key foundational elements that gamers want is quality. Now, if you're not familiar with the gaming industry, this seems pretty obvious. Of course gamers want quality. So does everyone, right? Well, the reason this is counterintuitive is that most gaming studios today are not actually delivering quality products at the time of launch. In fact, if you go back 10 or 15 years ago, most gaming companies wouldn't have put out the quality of games that are launched today as an early beta version. I believe that there's two core reasons this is happening. The first one is that as more and more games have gone virtual, they've allowed gaming studios to put out patches to either fix broken content, to rebalance the game, or to add additional features that should have been included at the launch after the fact. The second reason I think is even worse. With the rise of downloadable content, microtransactions, and pay-to-win gaming structures, now gaming studios actually have an incentive to add additional content after the game has launched because it allows them to monetize it further. If a game mode isn't balanced at launch, it provides a rationale to make a gamer pay more money through stronger heroes or loot boxes or more items that they can purchase after the game is released. If you think about tech companies, this is the same way that Apple and other you know, Android devices have built in forced obsolescence to their hardware. What happens is over time, you have to replace your device and pay more money to the company. Or in the same way, auto manufacturers build in poor quality. It forces you to purchase another vehicle in a shorter timeline than you would originally had to. This is the same issue, but in reverse. Now, gaming studios are forcing you to pay more money right at the time of launch to get a product that should have been at a higher quality right off the bat. Let's look at a counterexample. By far, the most popular game of the last two years is Elden Ring. Elden Ring is an action RPG focused on PvE combat and exploring. When you look at gamer reviews for this new title, it becomes clear that fans of the genre love the gameplay, the difficulty curve, the open world environment, the storyline, the polish that's been put into it from the beginning. It's likely the case that FromSoft, the game developer, will provide additional content in the future, but it's not necessary. And gamers have rewarded the development studio by pushing it to incredible heights. In fact, over the first two and a half weeks after launch, it sold over 12 million copies. This puts it in incredibly rarefied air, with titles such as Grand Theft Auto V and Cyberpunk 2077. Current game developers, both in the traditional and the crypto space, need to take notice of this. Gamers are happy to pay for quality when it's transparent to them. The second foundational element that gamers want from their gaming studios is transparency. Over the last 50 years, games have become less and less transparent in their payment structures. In fact, originally, you knew exactly what it was you were purchasing from a game. If you think back to the early days of the arcade, you could watch the person in front of you put a quarter into the machine, and you knew exactly what that gameplay experience was going to be like. As we've evolved, it's become less and less transparent. So console games, you still had ownership of the asset itself, but you were never sure what additional titles a gaming studio might launch in the future. As we've moved to additional things like downloadable content models, subscription-based services, microtransactions, pay-to-win gaming models, the transparency is now sorely lacking in the game industry. And gamers are rightfully concerned 
that NFTs and crypto gaming may just be the next in a long line of additional ways to milk them for more and more money. Specificity and transparency in pricing breed trust, and the gaming industry has very little of it right now. I've developed a model that we're going to look at through the remainder of this series that focuses on the evolution of monetization models and asset ownership models in the gaming industry as a whole. Gamers are right to be concerned, but I believe that as we look at the structure and the changes, we're headed towards a more positive experience over time as gamers in this ecosystem. Transparency is a perfectly reasonable expectation, and it's one that we all should have. The final thing that gamers want is value. As of early 2022, there are 3 billion gamers worldwide that are spending 250 billion US dollars annually playing their games of choice. Average spending in the US and Europe is around $300 per year per gamer. Gamers are willing and happy to pay for the community and the entertainment value that games provide them. That value proposition though is essential. In fact, they don't mind creative ways to ask them to pay for the games of their choice. Let's take a look at some of the interesting ways that Fortnite has monetized cosmetics within their gaming ecosystem. For those of you who haven't played Fortnite, it's a free-to-play battle arena style game. If you're a fan of Hunger Games, think of a large-scale 100-person version of that combat in an animated style. The game itself is entirely free-to-play, and you can't pay to improve your competitiveness, so there's no pay-to-win aspect. This seems difficult to monetize. However, Fortnite has made on average about $3 billion per year for the last four years, averaging 200 million players. How did they manage this? Well, essentially, Fortnite was able to monetize fashion and the flex factor in their game. They offer purchases of individual items or a seasonal battle pass that gives out visual improvements to your player's characters. If you see an epic looking gun or a particularly lit outfit for your character that you want, you can pay to own it. Roughly 80% of Fortnite players have paid for a battle pass at some point, whose only utility is cosmetic in nature. Gamers are 100% willing to pay for non-essential in-game items to fund a company that they believe in and appreciate. That said, after spending $500 on skins only to lose out on them completely, when a game has lost its enjoyment feels really bad to most gamers. This is part of the reason why 80% of gamers, when asked, want to be able to trade or sell cosmetics and other assets that they have earned in the games that they play. They recognize that they have worked hard and they've paid money for those assets and they should retain some right of ownership over them. In most current gaming environments, that's not allowed though. Gamers also recognize that large traditional game manufacturers are using terms like NFT as a way to rebrand topics like loot boxes that just get them to pay more and more money for the games that they already are wanting to play. And they see that most crypto game studios are just another version of that. In fact, many crypto games are simply forcing you to pay money up front to own assets with a game that hasn't even been developed. And in a lot of cases, that's rapidly inflating away the value of the assets that you're purchasing. That's not even to mention a lot of the gaming projects that are complete scams or rugs. It doesn't have to be this way. But if these valid concerns aren't addressed, then crypto gaming doesn't have a long-term future outside of niche degenerates, short-lived pay-to-play Ponzi schemes, and a very small pool of gamers who actually appreciate them for the content itself. I believe that the gaming industry is incredible. It's been a catalyst for the development of thousands of online communities and provided entertainment value to billions of us. And I know that there's a lot of animosity between the crypto community and traditional gamers. I think much of it is understandable in the context of these three expectations that the gamers have for their game titles in the future. I'm not here to attack or defend anybody, but instead to make some observations that I think will help us all in understanding what is the state of the gaming industry today. You're never as good as you think or as bad as you are afraid of, and gamers and the gaming industry is no different. In my next video, which I'll link in the description below, I'll share where crypto games stack up against these expectations and why gamers hate crypto. It's sure to be entertaining, and I hope to see you there. Now you know what Annie knows about what gamers want.